this is open um, territory. Whereas the biometric is that it is very uh, narrow in terms of frequency. Ah, right? yeah. But suppose you want to detect some sources, mm -hmm. you know in advance of specific frequencies. Yeah. Then you may want to tune the mirror or other instruments in some sense to, to respond um, better to these kind of uh, sources. And there are ways of doing that. Well, basically by, okay, if you adjust the signal recycling mirror, you can get to a narrow band response. Yes, to go spring, not the not the current use that we Sure. Uh, no, I mean I don't think it would work to try to well, stupid question. So uh, I think it's it's an interesting point. And, and so I, I understand what you're saying, that if you can somehow tune the frequencies of some of the I guess the thing I would worry about is that you're always going to have some level of noise at any given frequency. Sure. And so the question would be and could you set a threshold in some sense so that a signal above that threshold would excite a nonlinear instability and really amplify things, whereas the, the standard everyday noise would not? Yeah. And also, another point about the world is that the noise would when the spawn is the same time as the signal. Yeah. So that would also. Yeah. So, oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> that was what I was, I think I was going to say. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, if you could get rid of noise and make sure that the only thing that caused the parameter against the visibility of the signal, then yes, it's a nice way of underwriting the field. It's not just the, the, the mirror, the, the suspension also has some kind of um, oh. acoustic instability as well. There's something we you can explore. Yeah. No? Well, I, I mean, I doubt it, but. Um, equations to make sure that um, <laughs> make sure that this is not a big missed opportunity. I, mean, I don't think it is. Okay, so the next thing to draw is, is the so-called noise curve, which is the sensitivity of the detector at different frequencies. Um, so, you know, if there is no signal in the detector, you still see uh, non-trivial, uh, I mean, non-zero output, and this is composed of different noise components at uh, different frequencies. So is 10 to the minus 23, which is kind of our goal, and then the amount of noise, so you can imagine basically taking the Fourier transform of uh, the output detector and it's just pure noise and looking at the amplitudes of that at different uh, frequencies. Um, and we call this the power spectral density. I mean, now, the amplitude, well, the squared amplitude of, of the Fourier transform is basically the power spectral density. You take the square root of that, we call it the amplitude spectral density. Um, it's just a measure of how noisy the detector is at different frequencies. So around about 100 hertz, it dips below this magically 10 to the minus 23 point. I mean, it could be, this, this is not guaranteed as a quantitative plot, but um, <laughs> this is more or less what happens. Um, and then, it just goes up as proportional to, I believe it's just proportional to f at higher frequencies. And this is due to this effect, like the photon, um, well, the photon stays in the arms for a certain length of time, and then it sees more and more gravitational wave cycles, and then the gravitational wave cycles start to cancel against each other, which reduces the density at high frequencies. Um, then, okay, you have some interesting stuff that goes on. As we see, the detectors are located in the United States. The electrical power in the United States is provided at 60 hertz. Um, you cannot completely isolate everything in the interferometer from 60 hertz power line. So you have some crap in this. You have some big line here excess noise at 60 hertz. Uh, you also have some interesting stuff happening at 20, 30, 40 hertz. Um, could be mechanical resonances. Um, uh, this is due, this is associated with, um, let's say, modes of the mirrors which are not just going back and forth, but are like tipping back and forth, bounce, roll, etc. Um, and then you have the 
noise that goes way, way up very quickly uh, beyond 10 hertz. Um, again, this may not be to scale, um, but yeah, this is the stuff that the suspension has been engineered to suppress by 10 orders of magnitude. So if there wasn't a suspension, you would already be like way, way up, much higher here. Um, and then suspension has many um, active and passive controls and feedbacks um, that you know, allow it to get the noise down to this level. But essentially, there is uh, even even when you're feed, when you're implementing feedback to, to remove to remove the seismic components of the noise. Well, the way that you've implemented the feedback loop is via sensors, it's via uh, actuators. Those components themselves have noise, um, and uh, it takes a long time to hunt down every pos every possible source of noise in the control uh, control of every degree of freedom that the mirrors can move in. So uh, it's eventually you want the low frequency sensitivity to be really dominated by the seismic noise. Um, but okay, seismic noise would be more like that. So the fact that you have like still some orders of magnitude that low frequencies above the seismic noise floor is due to the fact that, well, you haven't hunted down every possible source of noise in this very complicated uh, control and feedback system. But, I mean, people have done a really excellent job so far because if you look at initial light dose sensitivity, um, well, let's see, I haven't drawn that. What am I trying to show? So, no. let's see, this. Um, initial light sensitivity would be many, many orders of magnitude above this at 10 hertz. So let's say 30 hertz. So initial LIGO sensitivity was much, much, much worse than advanced LIGO low frequencies, but only slightly worse <laughs> at mid and high frequencies. Uh, the dominant noise source uh, at mid and high frequencies is basically the photon noise or shot noise or uh, quantum noise due to the fact you have a finite number of photons and uh, they only arrive at your photo can arrive at the photo detector um, you, know, you can either have one photon or zero so you have some statistical counting noise in the number of photons um, but uh, the, the major success of advanced light so far in terms of the technology is being able to use these suspensions and the uh, of the mirrors, um, which, uh, which give you this huge increase in sensitivity at low frequencies. And that's also very important to be able to detect um, high mass objects like black holes. So, I'm just going to draw. So, if we take one of these signals and just take the Fourier transform of it, we can plot it more or less on the same axes. I mean, uh, being rather um, cavalier about exactly what axes these are and whether you've got really the right number of powers of frequency, but you can certainly compare this noise curve with the Fourier transform of, uh, of the signal. So, uh, I think it's going to look somewhat like that. So, this little bump here is the merger. The merger happens at a specific frequency or a specific range of frequencies. Um, this fall off here is this ring down. So the ring down, this last period here, where after the two black holes merge together, essentially you can describe it as the um, perturbative oscillations of a single final black hole. And these happen to be at a slightly higher frequency than the merger. Um, and then this part is the in spiral, um, which just keeps on going down lower and lower frequency back into the indefinite past. Well, okay, you can't observe it when the noise gets too high, um, but uh, this is if you try to follow this early part of the signal back, um, then you just get, well, you can't observe it because it goes too low frequency, but if you had a low frequency gravitational wave detector like LISA, you could have observed it. 
um, at the point when it was emitting at that frequency. So yeah, as you see here, uh, at this point, the signals, uh, you can see there's some sort of oscillation, but you try to follow it back and it just, just um, goes into the noise. <laughs> so, and by, by the way, this thing, what is plotted on the t-shirt is absolutely not the raw output of the detector. And that's for a number of reasons. So, there's one extra thing here. There's a couple of very, very narrow lines here, which are the so-called violin modes. So what the uh, suspensions actually look like, if you imagine the end mirror, so the laser light falls onto the end mirror here. This is the beam. The end mirror is suspended by certain uh, silica fibers, which are welded using this nice uh, silica welding technique uh, developed in Glasgow uh, to the to little ears on the edge of the, the mirrors. These are then welded to identical uh, silica masses for uh, dynamical reasons of the way the way this. Um, suppression of the, the seismic vibrations is set up, and then these are suspended in turn from <coughs> chunks of metal, which are suspended from other chunks of metal, and these all have sensors and controls on them to stop them moving, moving too fast. Anyway, these are extremely high Q-factor resonators. Um, so if you were to, uh, let's say, blow on one of these fibers, it would resonate for many hours. And basically, the reason this is done is to collect all the thermal noise. So, uh, if these were, let's say, sticks of wood with incredibly low quality factor, then, well, you're operating at room temperature, you have thermal noise. The thermal noise will get into the mirrors, uh, will get into the motion of the mirrors, and the thermal noise will be spread over all frequencies. If you make these into very high quality factor resonators at a specific frequency, then all of the random noise um, will be effectively gathered into the, at that one frequency, and that will give you some very sharp but very high lines in the spectrum. Um, so this actually makes it easy to, to do the data analysis because uh, when you're analyzing the data, you should just ignore what's happening. You should ignore what's happening around 60 hertz, and you should ignore what's happening with these violin modes as well. So that's one thing. I mean, if you were to just plot the raw output of the detectors, what you would get is low frequency noise, violin modes, 60 hertz noise. You would not see any hint of a gravitational wave. So even if you, let's say, high pass out the, um, yeah, it's pretty simple to, to just filter out low frequency noise. It's like if you have a hi-fi system and then you turn down the bass. Um, but then what you're left with is violin modes 60 hertz. So then you need to notch those out and put them through a special uh, filter. And then, you know, this is, so this is absolutely not the raw output of the detectors. You still have to be quite clever to design some sort of filtering uh, to, to get this nice um, visible signal out of, out of the detectors. And this only works because it's a relatively short signal with a few cycles and you know, it has high amplitude. Um, if, this, uh, if we had detected by a neutron star or even a uh, significantly lower mass binary black hole system, no matter what sort of clever filtering we did to, this, to the HFC output, we wouldn't be able to see it by that. So, okay, this is lucky in the sort of publicity sense that we could actually <laughs> put the signal on a t-shirt. Um, so, in order to improve the sensitivity going forward, so to get below this curve, below this noise curve, well, you have to deal with these technical noise sources which are keeping this part of the, the noise curve above the seismic noise, um, but you also have to be able to increase the laser power, and I mean, that's 
technically different, as I said, for, for a number of different reasons. There, when you use the laser power, there's basically all sorts of instabilities that kick in here, and not just parametric instabilities. Um, so and just high quickly size the domain twice so the noise. Yes, exactly. Okay. So actually from around here upwards this uh, this uh, element of the noise is completely dis explained by by basic uh, well not basic but but uh, mm -hmm. by fundamental quantum noise. Okay. So you say another source is kind of cancellation is still so we had problem just crossing. Mm -hmm. uh, so well the fact that the shock noise goes up at high frequencies is because we have uh, this finite amount of time mm -hmm. uh, that the, the photon spends in mm -hmm. each hour. Uh, if you make the arms shorter, uh, or if you reduce the finesse, then, well, the point at which this happens will go up in frequency, but then also you get a worse overall sensitivity. Um, so it's a trade-off. Okay, so, I, I mean, for the next observing one, I think oh, it's a goal to go 20, 35, 35 watts. So gradual increase in power, um, no big leaps up to 100 watts or 200 watts. Um, and then, uh, again, people are doing more work on getting these control noises at low frequency improved. So now, I'm not going to make any promises of how much better the sensitivity will be in the next observing run relative to the first one, but I think uh, there's more emphasis being placed on improving the mid and low frequency sensitivity rather than just trying to pump up the power uh, at this point. And, okay, if your sources are <laughs> cutting off at a few hundred hertz, then, it's, again, it's, this will uh, improve the amount of science you're able to do with them. Um, so yeah, this is a 30-30 cell mass and we've got coal. We've got some other chalk colors. Um, so, well, essentially if you take, uh, one nice feature of gravitational wave signal is if you just scale down the masses, well, gravitational wave signal from a compact binary is, if you just scale down, scale the masses down, it's essentially equivalent to scaling up the frequency. So you can just take this curve and translate it to different back and forth in frequencies or up and down in amplitudes if you want to show what different masses of binary black holes or different distances from the, from the Earth uh, are produced. So let's say, you know, This would be, I don't know, 5, five plus 5 or 10 plus 10 by the black hole. Um, black blue. And if we go way up in frequency, this might be a BM system. So, um, unfortunately, for the uh, prospect of uh, looking at binary neutron star mergers, looking at the actual merger portion of the binary neutron star, that may be at thousands of hertz. So that is, a, again, at a point where the diffundal sensitivity at present is not very good. Um, but essentially, all of these tracks, well, up to the fact that you have some effects that the binary neutron stars don't behave exactly like black holes, um, all of these tracks are just proportional to each other. Um, so uh, this is a nice way of just seeing by eye um, how the different possible signals, the compact binary signals you can get compared with, with the different noise curves. So, uh, I guess it's uh, an issue related with the black hole or the one. The, the, the nice that you are plotting, right? All the objects would be observed by the previous version of black on the Earth, or uh, they would have too little uh, signal to noise, or? Um, so, okay. One way of thinking of this plot is if you look at the area under the area between the curve and the um, and the noise, the area between the signal and the noise curve. If you integrate that, that's proportional to the signal's noise ratio, which is essentially the detectability of the signal. Um, so, well, all of them would have non-zero signal-to-noise ratio in, in, 
initial LIGO, but maybe only one, two, three, four. Uh, oh. So, oh, they would not be detectable. And one, one thing that people sometimes forget is uh, that our data contains signals all the time. It's full of signals. Unfortunately, they're all much, well, almost all of them are much quieter than the noise. So we can't tell where they are, we can't identify them, we can't write nice papers about them. Um, so one thing, I think one, um, one fact from the template analysis is signal to noise ratio of this particular signal um, considering data from both the detectors together um, is 24. So, well, what does this mean? Um, essentially, if you consider, well, if you take this signal and you just multiply it by uh, detector noise, then, well, multiply in what sense? Um, let's call this H T um, H T W T, and then you multiply by the detector noise S of T. Um, So what I'm trying to write down here is something called a matched filter, um, where, okay, to determine if the signal is present at a given time in the output of the detector, um, so let's write this down correctly. You invent a, a fake time variable tau, then you multiply the signal you're looking for by the output of the detector. Um, you integrate over your dummy time variable, and then that, that essentially gives you the signal to noise ratio, which is uh, your estimate of how likely it is that the signal was present at that well, with a merger at that particular time t. Now, what I've missed out here is um, some crucial extra, extra factor which accounts for the fact that you don't have white noise, you have this interesting colored uh, noise which is different in different frequencies. So, okay, to account for this, rather than writing this um, match filter, well, it's just a linear product of the, um, it's just a linear integration of the signal you're interested in versus, uh, against the output of the detector, but to account for this colored noise, you, you know, it's much easier to write this in frequency domain. Anyway, it's a technical detail. Um, if you were to do this at just one time for one template, um, so you're looking for a signal which is all the parameters are exactly known, um, then You would get a uh, distribution of values of this match filter, signal to noise ratio, whatever you call it, which is just a Gaussian around zero. So, what does this mean? When you take, uh, if all that's in your detector is just noise, and then you multiply it by your template, and um, your template is uh, one precisely known signal, precisely known uh, shape at one precisely known time, then you get this unit Gaussian. So, and if your detector is behaving perfectly, um, you get a well-known distribution. Um, so this is signal to noise ratio growth. Okay, one thing that we don't know is 
whether the um, uh, whether let's say at the maximum amplitude you have a peak or you have um, you can have at the time of merger you can be seeing the peak of the waveform or you can see the zero crossing or you can see some other phase. <coughs> so essentially we don't know how far around the orbit um, the two the binary is at the point of merger. So that's something called the coalescence phase, and that's something that we don't know, obviously, um, in advance. So what we do is we take the filter for the uh, cosine phase, and we take the filter for the sine phase, uh, and we just um, take some of the squares of the two. So rather than having this um, Gaussian center at zero, we actually have a Raleigh distribution, uh, which is has its maximum of one, and then the Average value is, is square root of 2. Okay, but that's one thing. We also don't know what time the signal will arrive, so we have to do this many, many times. Um, we have to do it you know, once every, I think, uh, about a thousand times per second um, in order to uh, be sure of not missing any signals if they're there. Um, so rather than just having a uh, distribution. Uh, around one, well, we have to sum up every second a thousand of, a thousand of these uh, noise distributions, and then, okay, we don't know the noise parameters, but the mass parameters of the signal. So we have to do this not just for one set of masses and spins, but well, it turns out we need about 200,000 uh, different templates. Um, so, okay, you have this distribution of noise. Uh, so distribution for signal to noise ratio um, in the presence of no signals and with just perfect detecting noise. Um, what you have to do is you, know, you imagine this multiplied by the number of time samples, which is millions, and then by the number of uh, templates, which is hundreds of thousands. And then, in order to know whether you've detected something or not, so what I have told you is uh, what happens in presence of the signal. The signal is red. Okay, so that's one. I don't know, this is 20. So in the presence of the signal, the distribution of match filter values you get is maybe like that. Now you'd think, well, if that's the distribution in noise and that's the distribution in the presence of the signal, it's pretty difficult, it's sorry, pretty easy to tell the difference between one and the other. But, as I said, you have you know, an enormous number of times you have to do this procedure and almost all of them contain either pure noise or very, very low level signal. So in fact, uh, the tail of the noise distribution as the Gaussian, rather than being this well-behaved thing that drops off very quickly here, it, you know, even if the detector is behaving perfectly, can't really claim to de detect something until the signal to noise ratio is a quarter ten. And that's simply because of the enormous number of time samples and the enormous number of, of templates we have to uh, filter. Anyway, this was 24, so this was actually a lot louder than uh, at any point we would have had difficulty in, in uh, detecting it. So, well, it's quite lucky. <laughs> um, what point was I trying to make here? <laughs> <laughs> they were, if you were answering the question, they weren't observable by the previous slide. Right, so, okay, <laughs> if I'm saying the signal to noise ratio is 24, but, okay, at these low frequencies you have a very big factor of improvement between initial and advanced LIGO. Uh, so I think, uh, I think the statement is that signal to noise ratio would have been 4, but don't quote me on that, it may have been 6. But, okay, you look at 6, 6 is still like well into very big noise here. So you can't say signal to noise ratio of 6 means 6, signal like that's no, not the correct way of thinking about this. Now, if the signal to noise ratio initial LIGO had been a 4 to 10, then we could have had a chance of actually detecting it. But no, this means that it would be, no, it would probably create <coughs> A trigger, let's say, it would cause the search to record some event, but that event would be uh, completely buried in the noise. So it's 
though we have no, no chance of uh, actually detecting it. Okay, Thomas, uh, so right now we have uh, a live uh, feed from Madrid because of uh, they, they want to report on the uh, results by Lisa Pathfinder. And uh, do you want to see it now? I have to make a break now? But uh, no, yeah, there's no. also coffee, I believe. Yes, so, okay, but uh, we can uh, resume later or I mean, whatever. Already, so, this was basically my explanation of the terminated search, so that's done. Yeah. Okay. So, only priority estimation remains. Well, in principle. And anything else? Okay, okay. I think. Thank you.